title of Mason Bradbury's talk from Florida International University is Conservation at the Bering State and Differing Histories of Protection of Tropical Hydrotanics and Pine Rockland. You should be able to share your screen. Okay, great. Um, okay. Um, I, let me see if I can get it in presentation mode here. Okay, so I'm Mason Bradbury. I'm a PhD student at Florida International. Um, Mike Ross and Gail Hollander are my co-advisors. And just to give you a tiny bit of context about um, where this research fits within my kind of um, dissertation, um, this, this will be kind of the first chapter. And some of you have probably received um, emails from me asking about interviews. And the reason for that is that the rest of my dissertation covers more contemporary subjects, um, things about the kind of social context and, and some of the challenges, opportunities um, associated with restoration at the Deering Estate. So I uh, just wanted to say that. Um, so again, um, I'm gonna be looking at um, the, the conservation actions that Charles Deering took at the Deering Estate and sort of placing those in, in the context of the, the kind of broader environmental movement at the time, the early 1900s, as well as sort of what that has resulted in, in terms of our um, conservation context with pine rocklands and tropical hardwood hammocks. Um, so to start off, first of all, um, I wanna start off with an observation. So I'm gonna ask you all to think about the largest protected upland areas around Miami, um, accepting any within Everglades National Park. Um, think about sites on the coastal ridge, barrier islands, et cetera. Um, okay, and so uh, a few of those, um, Grandin Park, uh, Bill Baggs Cape Florida State Park, Matheson Hammock, uh, Matheson, R. Hardy Matheson Preserve, the Deering Estate. Um, what do all of those have in common? Um, and I've placed them on the map so that maybe you can see that. And on that map, the, uh, the gray area, that's showing the Atlantic Coastal Ridge. Um, and so things that they have in common are they are all waterfront properties, um, which is a little bit contrary to expectation if you think about the ways that protected areas generally get established. Um, typically, we establish protected areas that they're sort of the leftovers that weren't useful for agriculture, weren't useful for urban development. They are lands that were kind of left over after development processes have taken place. That's not what's going on here. These are some of the most, some of the most valuable real estate in the county. And so that's, that's kind of an interesting thing. And um, sort of the, the reason behind that, they are consolidated or owned by early 20th century Miami elite. So the Deerings, uh, James Deering in the case of Cape Florida, um, Charles Deering in the case of both the R. Hardy Matheson County Preserve and also the Deering estate. And then the Mathesons as well with Crandon Park and Matheson Hammock. And then one final note though, they're, they're more characterized by tropical hardwood forest than by pine forest. Of course, the Deering Estate has some pine rocklands. Our hardy Matheson Preserve has a very small um, area of pine rocklands. But in general, these are the kind of more notable aspects of these sites are their tropical forests. And just to emphasize that a little bit more, uh, this is data from a paper these are the largest upland eel preserves. Um, these are the four that are larger than 100 hectares. And you can see that they correspond to that, the map I showed just previously. And under ecosystem categories there, hardwood hammocks and then uh, Deering Estate is the only one that was categorized as having some um, pine rockland as well. So um, I think those two things together require some explanation. Um, one, why are our largest protected areas, um, why are they right on the water? Uh, why do they stem from, from these rich landowners from the early 1900s and why are they more characterized by hardwood hammocks? Um, 
And so in order to sort of explain that, I, I'm going to be looking into the early 1900s environmental ethic. So all of these landowners were part of kind of an environmental movement in the early 1900s. Um, and so my thought is that by sort of looking at the priorities of that environmental movement, we can explore a bit um, why, why hardwood hammocks might have been more valued. Um, and so to do that, I'm taking the, the Deering estate as a, as a case study and Charles Deering's conservation actions as a case study. And so going to be looking at conservation actions that he undertook um, if there were differences in how those actions targeted tropical hardwood or pine rockland ecosystem types. And then um, at the end, just going to sort of guess at or hypothesize some broader social factors that might help explain those differences. Okay, um, so to start, here are Deering's property acquisitions in South Florida, Charles Deering's property acquisitions in South Florida that I am familiar with. Um, I'm just gonna get a drink of tea here. So I'll go north to south. We've got Bird Key, um, which is a really small natural um, island. It's not one of the spoil islands um, in the northern part of Biscayne Bay. Um, it, it was a rookery at the time that he purchased it. Um, and it seems as though he purchased it for the purposes of, of bird conservation, basically. Uh, he had the Buena Vista estate, which is a property around the, I think the current neighborhood is Morningside. It's like north of the design district in Miami. Um, that property was sold off during the real estate boom. But at the time that he purchased it, I think there were disturbed uplands, mangroves, and he established a rookery there. He had some, he was raising wild birds. Um, the Snapper Creek, Snapper Creek Hammock, which has now become our Hardy Matheson County Preserve, hammock and mangroves. Um, Chicken Key, which is part of the Deering Estate um, present day, um, had both um, upland vegetation, so hammock, mangroves, and he purchased it or acquired it uh, for the purposes of, of bird rookery. Deering Estate at Cutler, um, the Deering Estate today, um, hammock, pine rocklands, mangrove, coastal marsh, a really wide variety of ecosystems. And then finally, Pumpkin Key off of Key Largo, um, which I think today is like a privately owned island that it was up for sale. It was gonna, they were asking for something like 30 million or something. So if anybody has some extra money laying around. Um, and so it was uh, hammock vegetation and also mangroves. And so then in terms of his, his conservation actions that he took at the, the Deering Estate in Cutler, um, just real briefly, I think probably maybe the biggest and longest uh, sort of most important effect that any of his actions had were consolidation, just the process of buying up the property. At that time, um, what has become the Deering Estate, it was already parceled out. It was a bunch of small individual um, properties. It, it was a subdivision. Um, so there are a bunch of uh, individual landowners and through political connections, uh, plenty of financial resources, personal connections, he went through this process of consolidating this property. Um, and it took a number of years, um, a lot of financial resources, but he managed to do this. And as a result, we have this really impressive protected area, kind of in an urban, um, urbanized area. Um, he also took restor undertook restoration in, in collaboration with the botanist John Kunkel Small. John Kunkel Small was basically his like property manager, I guess you could say, or his scientific advisor, maybe it would be a better way to put it. Um, and so the, I've, this information, a lot of this information is coming from correspondence between John Kunkel Small and Charles Deering or other people. Um, and so there's a lot of discussion of uh, plans to reintroduce how to manage different parts of the hammock or different parts of the property. And so they were sort of doing a um, restoration, of course, didn't exist as in as a term at that point, but um, they were doing something similar to it back then. And then just in general preservation, 
Um, much of the property he during um, managed as, as a preserve uh, with no sort of economic activity or anything like that. Um, there's also this interesting example in what John Kunkel Small and Deering called the New Hammock, um, which I've shown on this uh, pretty simple map. Um, you've got the estate buildings, the house, the, uh, the wood house. This is like the visitor center parking lot. No, that's not. This is the visitor center parking lot if you're seeing my cursor. The new hammock is the area of hammock vegetation just south of, of the house and the other estate buildings. That area was not, um, was not originally a hammock. Um, and so in order to create that, there was rare native plant introduction and creation of, of this new hammock. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it in the next slide. Um, uh, so these are two photos taken from the same, I hope from the same location from the best of my ability to tell. And so this is within that new hammock area. There's a small um, stream, that uh, intermittent stream so the new hammock was planted in what was previously a pine forest with a road running through, a public road running through. Um, the photo on the left from 1917 was taken by David Fairchild. And in it, you can see the, you can see slash pine there and you can see the kind of relative openness. Um, you can't see the road, but um, they, John Kunkel Small and Charles Deering gradually introduced hammock vegetation to that area to establish this new hammock. And at least a number of the plants came from brickle hammock, um, large hardwood, tropical hardwood hammock just south of downtown Miami that at the time, early 1900s, was in the process of being developed, of being destroyed. And so they were sort of explicit about it. They didn't want these um, plant populations to be extirpated or for the plants to go extinct. And so they were transferring plants to this new hammock area. And that was part of the kind of establishment of this new hammock. Okay, so then in, um, to put some real general terms, differences in Deering's management of, of pine forest versus the hammocks, um, Hammocks were preserved, restored, beautified. There was, um, they maintained trails and kept, um, uh, tried to sort of keep aesthetic values in the hammocks. There were also very strict fire controls, so fire breaks and also firefighting sort of uh, preparation to prevent any fires from encroaching on the hammocks. Meanwhile, the pinelands were they're, they didn't talk about them much in conservation terms. They were used for experimental plantings. Uh, the photo on the right is their cactus garden where they were keeping cactus species from uh, different areas in the United States um, in order for kind of experimental and scientific purposes. There are also some economic uh, plantations. In other words, things that they were hoping to make money off of. They planted pecans, they planted uh, date palms in areas that were pine forest. So then why were hammocks more valued? Um, this is more in sort of broad general societal terms. I've got a few ideas. Um, in cultural terms, I think there was, um, there's not much, not many tropical systems in, in the continental US. And so there's a novelty to it. And there was a lot of aesthetic appreciation of the hammocks um, in, in literature or promotional material from South Florida from that time period, they talk in really glowing terms about the beauty of, of the tropical vegetation. Um, I think in, in political terms, there, from the scientific writings at the time, there seemed to be like a desire for the United States to have native tropical landscapes and species within the United States. It doesn't seem like there was much of a global sense of biodiversity established. And so they were concerned for conservation of these, these plants for the purposes of sort of keeping them and maintaining them within the United States. Um, in economic terms, I think the two ecosystem types had, had slightly different value in that helps explain why maybe hammocks were a little more valued for conservation purposes. Hammocks had value for tourism, so the aesthetic value. 
pine lands were an important source of timber for railroad ties and some construction materials, also kunti in earlier times, and then croplands in later times once, uh, once they had plowing methods to, to deal with the limestone substrate. And then a couple other things. In terms of historical context, there was just a lot more pine forest. It was much more, it covered a much greater area. Um, and so I don't think there was as much worry about it disappearing. Um, and a lot of the hammocks had already been converted because of urban development. And then finally, I think scientific theory at the time might explain a little bit of this different valuation. Um, Frederick Clements's ideas about succession and climax communities were kind of dominant at the time. And what that means is that people really um, prioritized or valorized climax communities and hardwood hammocks are the climax community. Disturbance was viewed uh, in kind of valued terms as bad. The, there was a lot of effort to prevent forest fires and that sort of thing. And so I think as a result, hardwood hammocks had a little more value. And then finally, why does it matter? Um, I think we, so I think it's just striking that there was a South Florida environmental movement exist in existence before Pine Rocklands had really been destroyed, before there's large scale destruction of Pine Rocklands, but, but because they weren't a conservation priority, um, it, uh, they still ended up getting destroyed um, or there's a, ended up getting converted to agriculture and other purposes. And so I think it's just, as with any kind of historical study, it's just important to, to look at history and consider if there are kind of analogous situations today. Are there things that we might regret in 50 to 100 years about our environmental managed, uh, management decisions, about the values that they're based on? Are there things that our values might change on? And are there things that um, environmental conditions might change and make our our decisions seem short-sighted. And so I think I'm out of time. Um, real quickly for acknowledgements, Deering Foundation has supported me. I'm one of the Deering Fellows, my co-advisors, my committee, um, FIU Tropics uh, supported this research as well. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mason. Um, we are about 10 minutes behind. So uh, we're gonna move on to the next talk. 